Diabetes and having a high body mass index, or BMI, cause nearly 6% of cancers worldwide. That's according to a new study in The Lancet that attributes 800,000 cancer cases each year to overweight, obesity, and diabetes. Fat increases the rate of estrogen that's circulating in the bloodstream, which increases the risk of that being utilized by the cancer to grow. Fat cells also increase inflammation in the body, which doctors now believe contributes to cancer and cardiovascular disease. Diabetes and obesity affect sugar levels, which also increases inflammation and hormones, which can increase cancer risk. The new study looked at data on 175 countries and linked diabetes and obesity to 18 cancers, with liver, breast, endometrial, and colorectal cancer accounting for most cases. All of which means that the number of cancer cases related to diabetes and high BMI is likely to keep increasing unless people around the world start getting healthy. We must take uh, big, big structural and innovative approaches to prevent obesity and to prevent diabetes. So we've got a long way to do on that, specifically tackling poor diet. That's why the World Health Organization has made non-communicable diseases and especially their link to obesity a campaign for action. The goal to reduce premature deaths from cancers, heart and lung diseases, and diabetes by 25% by 2025. That will require improved diets, including reduced sugar intake and more physical activity. And with more than 2 billion people around the world overweight and about 420 million diabetic, researchers say it's time to get healthy now. They're called non-communicable or chronic diseases worldwide, as we said, kills more than 40 million people each year. Two other important elements, by the way, to reducing these unnecessary deaths include reduction in tobacco use and alcohol consumption, both of which are higher in low- and middle-income countries, and they're the ones that have the largest cancer risk. And the good news is we don't need to wait for a breakthrough in medicine or anything. These are lifestyle changes that can oh, yeah. make significant decreases in these problems. Did you mention exercise? I did. I, I did, in fact. I know you did. <laughs> so important, though, that you Again. said lifestyle changes yes. because it's something that you just can't do for a couple of weeks or a couple of months. No, no. It's a whole, it's, you can start slow, but it's about a lifestyle change for yeah. life. Got it. Thank you, Doc. So thank you very much, everybody, and good morning and welcome. Uh, so just so you know that that was on last night, um, just so you know, I, I was struggling to think of what can I, I always like to show a video at the start of the, an event, and you know, I was struggling and probably spent more time on that than I should have. And um, what happened was right at about midnight, I don't know why that was significant, uh, I remembered that I saw this four hours earlier or five hours earlier, and I thought, oh my gosh, that's the most appropriate, perfect video that we could see to introduce food as medicine and the importance of it. Uh, let me shut off all my devices. <laughs> um, so I want to thank everybody for coming here today. This is our first Food as Medicine uh, Summit. And I say first because I want to make sure that we're kind of stuck, that we're kind of stuck and uh, do this every single year. Um, I want to welcome you to Hunter College here in East Harlem. My name is Charles Platkin, and I'm the director of the New York City Food Policy Center and a nutrition professor here at Hunter College. The idea for an all-day food policy event came about last year at one of our panel discussions. Towards the end, the 140 or so guests and panelists realized that there, were a lot, there was a lot more to talk about. Uh, we went over and we said, we really need more time. It was at that moment I said out loud, we needed to do an all-day event discussing food as medicine. Dr. Robert Graham was our first call. He has been incredibly helpful and supportive. I'd like to thank him for his commitment and his generosity. There are many others that contributed, including our more than 30 impressive, distinguished uh, guests and panelists. At this time, I'd like to call up someone who I admire and feel honored to have here at Hunter College, someone who has an incredible story about food as medicine. I welcome Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. Thank you, thank you, and good morning uh, to you all. Uh, I'm honored to be here. And uh, just briefly, as you are going to embark upon a conversation that is rich, uh, not in uh, calories, but in nutrition. <laughs> when I think about uh, back in 1984, when I became a member of the New York City Police Department as a rookie cop, uh, the city was going through a very difficult period. Uh, we were 
averaging 2,000 homicides a year, over uh, 90,000 robberies, 125,000 grand larcenies. Crack was pervasive. Uh, the entire attitude was a level of complacency. We should put signs in our vehicles, no radios. It was an understanding that someone was going to break our glass. Uh, rapes were through the roof. Uh, we were in a very uh, low period. And I remember leaving the academy with the concept and the belief and thought that there was not much we can do about crime. It was what it was. And the role of a rookie police officer was to patrol the streets and just try to keep the homicides and the robberies just one less than a year previously. And then Commissioner Bratton came along with the concept and he said, you know what, we can do something about crime. We can save lives. And he put in place these practices uh, that would go to the root cause of crime. And there was an entire middle management of chiefs and inspectors who said, this is ridiculous. We are knowledgeable about crime and the philosophies and the theories of crime. There's nothing you can do about it. This guy must be smoking the crap that they're selling on the street. Crime was what it was. And so that information never got to the rank and file police officers. And to finally Bratton understood, he must get rid of that middle management. And he must allow new recruits and young people to learn <laughs> What are the real possibilities of what we swore ourselves to do? And that was to serve and protect. And when he got rid of that middle management who became too complacent, it started a new generation of crime. People came out of their homes. Children started to grow instead of using, losing young people. That's where we are right now. When you think about medicine and what is happening with medicine. I think about last year, 2000 in uh, 16, being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in April. After coming from a family of so much uh, diabetic and so many other illnesses, five doctors that I visited here <coughs> in the city, city said, Eric, it was what it was. I lost my sight in my left eye. I was losing my sight in my right eye. I had nerve damage in my hands and feet. Had a small ulcer in my stomach. My esophagus was filled with sores because of acid reflux. My right thigh, the nerve damage was so severe, I could no longer feel uh, my right thigh. I was urinating all the time. And the doctors wanted to put me on insulin right away. They wanted to give me medicine for my ulcer, medicine for my esophagus, medicine uh, for my high blood pressure. Uh, they wanted me to take medicine for my PSA. My PSA level was high. My dad transitioned in uh, <coughs> 2015 to uh, prostate cancer. And I was going to go down the road, and I said to myself, I said, Eric, you used to be a cop. You know how to do investigations. You have three degrees. You know how to read. <laughs> Go read and find out what is going on. Why are so many people getting ill? And I was able to find something that dealt with a man called Doc, Dr. Esselton. Many of you probably heard of him. And I called him. And I said, Doctor, I would like to look at the things you're doing around hell. And he said, fly out to see me. He's a doctor who treated uh, Bill Clinton for his um, heart disease. And I flew to see him. And when I got there, there were about 12 or 13 of his patients. When I told them I was diabetic, they, you know, they basically laughed at me. They said, that's all? <laughs> we had massive heart issues that we were able to overcome. And Dr. Esselton said, Eric, if you change your lifestyle, I'm not on a diet. If you change your lifestyle, you will put your diabetes in remission. An interesting thing was the level of confidence that he had. This was not, well, maybe you would do it. He said, no, this is what's going to happen. Three weeks after changing my lifestyle, of going to a plant-based diet. I'm not a vegan. I believe in a vegan philosophy of we should not be cruel to animals, but I'm not a vegan because vegans eat Oreos and Coca-Cola and some other stuff. That's not me. I'm a plant-based eater. Three weeks after going plant-based. My sight cleared up. Three months, my A1C was in the high teens, went down to a 5.7. The ulcer, gone. The sores on my esophagus, gone. The nerve damage in my hands and feet, gone. Don't feel them anymore. The nerve damage in my thigh, gone. My PSA, 1.1. Some doctors would say the jury is out on if plant-based eating can heal us. And I'm trying to ask myself, what the heck courtroom are they in? <laughs> It is clear of what is happening when you change your body and you eat right. 
and we now need to move this conversation forward. And so my goal and what I'm doing in the borough of Brooklyn, I'm putting millions of dollars into our school system so our children can learn how to grow their food in their school system using hydroponics and aquaponics. Showing them how, if they are part of the process, what they can do. But then the real horrific part of this conversation and the tragic part of this conversation is not that 30 million people have diabetes. It's not that we're in a $3 trillion healthcare system. The real tragedy is those countless number of men and women who used to play with dolls and stethoscopes as children and say hopefully one day they will heal people and instead they're going through academic schools of medicine only learn how to treat symptoms and not underline the diseases. That's a Shakespearean tragedy about this whole conversation. That they want to heal and they're not given the opportunity to do so. The tragedy is, is when Dr. McDougall went to California and told the California legislators in Congress that we need to ensure that we're treated and teaching uh, health-based nutrition in our medical colleges, that they all boycott and afford against it the societies uh, that are for that. This is not a DNA problem because my mother is diabetic, I must be diabetic. This is not DNA, this is dinner. It's not lineage, it's lunch. It's not where you're born, it's breakfast. <coughs> And this Hatfield and McCoy conversation needs to end when you have the medical societies caught up in fighting with the veganism movement and it's been fighting so long that they don't even realize what they're fighting for. We're not trying to only save Molly the cow, we're trying to save Dolly your child. It's about how do we use nutrition to help people. And think about how many people went to their doctors and they sat in their doctor's room and their doctor told them there was nothing they can do and they lost their sight. Or they're now going through kidney failure. Or they're now losing their limbs. This is criminal what we're doing to the American public. And so my goal in the conversation with the mayor, as I can conclude, is that every HAC hospital in the city should have a plant-based unit with wraparound services, with a chef, with a real dietitian <laughs> to allow people the option. The American public should at least have the option. Why am I doing this? This is not <coughs> professional, it's personal. I spent 22 years of my life wearing a bulletproof vest, standing on street corners, protecting the children and families of the city, watching babies grow. Now the real challenge is not the drive-by, it's the drive-through. <laughs> the same compassion and energy I brought to ensuring that our families were able to grow and thrive in this borough. It's what I want to do in this issue of health care. We cannot continue to boast ourselves and say we're living longer because grandma living to 90 but can't identify her children because of the meat that has corroded the arteries to her brain and gave her dementia. It's not living. The goal is not just to survive. The goal is to be alive. And that is the mission that we're on. Thank you very much. Brooklyn Borough President, that was incredible and inspirational, and I thank you so much. That was fantastic. I want to uh, bring up to the uh, to the podium, and let me let me get his PowerPoint set up, so he doesn't have to do it. Dr. Robert Graham, um, I really again want to reiterate that what you've done and what you do and how you're doing it is special, kind, generous, and uh, very thoughtful. I'd like to give him a warm welcome. So I wear a couple of coats, and I'm gonna switch into one right now, okay? <laughs> Mr. Adams, this is what we need. More of you, speaking the gospel, man. And can I just say, you didn't have to go all the way to, you know, Ethelson's office. You could have come right across the park and could have saw me. <laughs> all right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, so this is truly a dream come true. Um, I firmly believe that if we're gonna change this thing called food and healthcare, we gotta bring everyone to the table. Um, and it's just not doctors. I go to a lot of conferences, and you're exactly right. I speak to them, I get, I get a pre-conference, you know, I'm not even part of the main 
main stage sometimes. Um, but I really wanted just to kind of ground us today in honoring um, everyone and thanking everyone. Hope you all had a great Thanksgiving, right? Talk about a table there. In honor of Thanksgiving and the upcoming holiday season, I really want to thank each and every one of you for taking time out of your busy day to spend time with us today. You could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here, and I really, truly appreciate it. Thank you all for coming today. Let me invite you to our table. This is our Thanksgiving table. And I want, especially in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I want to just give a couple of thanks. So I want to give a thanks to this woman here, my mom, for teaching me that food is medicine ever since I was a little kid. Then my dad. My dad always told me and reminds me, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And then I got my brother, John. <laughs> who says, you got to keep it real, you got to keep it moving. <laughs> and last but not least, the one that does everything for us at home, and for always saying to me, if not you, who? And I think this is really important to think about that. You can't wait for someone to change. you got to be the change. And I, we're all here today because this statement by Wendell Berry. People are fed by the food industry, which pays no attention to health, and are treated by a health industry which pays no attention to food. Is, is that crazy? crazy? Crazy, crazy, crazy. And so, but I believe for change to occur in our food and healthcare systems, and I put them together, food and healthcare systems, all of us must come to the table. We all must be open-minded, right? Because we're not all vegans and we're not all paleo. We all want to eat good food. But farmers, chefs, doctors, nurses, nutritionists, policymakers, government, community, media, restaurateurs, and most importantly than anyone else, patients have to be at the table. We must find ways to cut out pro programmatic bureaucracy and boundaries. Those are just set, set there to limit our expansion. Today is a reflection of the shift that's going on in the world. You guys can feel it, right? It's a special day today here. Just a few years ago, talking about food as the root cause of any illnesses, of many illnesses, was very controversial and in fact trivialized in medicine. It made the type of medicine this Ayurvedic proverb. When diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. When diet is correct, medicine is of no need. It made the type of medicine I wanted to practice and I went to medical school and I taught and I still continue to practice. Make it so difficult to do this because much of the medical industry, not healthcare, I can't remember the last time I saw health and care in healthcare. The medical industry is still stuck in the old paradigm of illness being caused by germs, genes, and Mr. as Mr. Adams said, bad luck. And the majority of the medical treatments consist of this, a pill for every ill, compressed in a 15-minute visit. How are you going to get anything out of someone, right? Let alone addressing the medications that are currently on. You're never going to get the lifestyle of this medicine. So I firmly believe that we've reached a tipping point on several points. Thanks, in particularly, to no small small part of all of you here in this, in this room today. You know, we've given government, food, and medical <laughs> systems permission to act in ways to make us more healthy. But in fact, they failed us. And my goal, again, we're trying to get all these people onto the same page, onto the same table. And this is how they failed us, right? So this is a week worth of food, okay? What you don't see? You don't see green. Well, false. You see green apple. I mean, a, a green a, a grape there. You see two, two, two tomatoes. But as you can see, this is how the government has failed us. All of you in this room have so diligently worked away, often for years, to bring truth about the connection of food and health to the world. As a good food movement community, we are here today. We've accomplished a lot. And I hope today we'll reaffirm, renew, inspire, your passion, dedication, and ambition. Just imagine what we may be able to accomplish if we all came to the same table. And that's why I invited all of you to the table here today. I think the responsibility for a healthier future lies with no one person, group, or government, but rather all of us. Anyone can get involved. And you're going to hear from the, throughout the day today organizations like Wholesome Wave, the Green Bronx Machine, like the Burr President's office, countless others, Harlem Grown, 
There are so many people here that you need to meet because they are truly a special community here today. We gotta keep the world moving in the right direction. There are different roles to play, but none of us can afford to back down. There's still so much work to do. This is the most important thing. Why is our food killing us? Four of the top 10 reasons we are dying in today's society are related to <coughs> diet and obesity. Four, heart disease, all cancers, stroke, and diabetes. The costs of our society are high, and without intervention, this will rise astronomically over the next 20 years, but we need to change our thinking. So this is when I had an idea. <laughs> what would healthcare and medical systems look like if we approached food as a remedy, or found scalable models that reduce obesity and therefore reduce costs? Going back old school, right? Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. So I, over 12 years ago, started writing prescriptions for food. Eat real food, eat whole food, plant-based diet, eat more fruits and vegetables. And guess what? People started filling those prescriptions up and started eating them. This led to the idea, what if we taught people how to cook? What if we taught doctors how to cook? And this is a, a study, um, um, an article that was done in 2012. In 2012, alongside my wife, Julie, we started Feral Wellness and hosted our first cooking class, the doctor residence, at ICE, in this, the Institute for Culinary Education. Since then, we have moved our teaching center and found our true home at the Natural Gourmet Institute, where we taught over 250 doctors. Oh, I gotta mention this here. So this is the late Anne-Marie Colvin, the founder of Natural Gourmet Institute. If you don't know her, you gotta know her. Talk about a food hero. And this is where we started cooking, at the Natural Gourmet Institute. Over 250 doctors, 50 hospital chefs, dietitians were taught how to cook a healthy, whole food, plant-based meal at the Natural Gourmet Institute on Mondays to support our good friend Sid Lerner and the Meatless Monday campaign. This was a 2014 article called Doctors Without Burgers. <laughs> <laughs> and the goals were simple. I wanted to make these healthy classes, whole food, plant-based, accessible to doctors through culinary education and nutrition education, allow them to prepare and better, to better discuss food choices with their patients. Oftentimes, as, a, as an academic, teaching doctors how to counsel the patients about <coughs> nutrition, it basically comes to three things. Don't eat, don't eat salt, don't eat sugar, and don't eat fat. What's missing in that? What to eat, right, exactly. And it's usually at the doorknob, right? By, by the way, you know, kind of. <laughs> and so, Inspired by the Victory Gardens of World War II and the simple fact that hospital, hospital food sucks, right? We decided, again, Julie and I decided, we opened our own Victory Greens, the first ever edible garden. We turned this into this, eventually into that, and a place where actually doctors, nurses, engineering, housekeeping, all can congregate and eat outside. We raise plants, we raise vegetables and fruits, so ultimately, we can actually invite our friends from the neighborhood of Candle Cafe, actually take some of the extra herbs and the vegetables that we grow. Let me take you into the garden really quick. This is Edible, uh, Edible Manhattan, actually came and featured us as well. And so we grew plants and herbs and feed them to our hospital employees and staff and patients. As you can see, this is one of the chefs coming up there, snipping some of the Giuseppe basil. And over 20, in 2015, 20,000 people visited Victory Green Garden. Now, we're almost there, but I gotta tell you something here. Nearly one in three children's hospitals in America have a fast food restaurant inside of them. I have written to hospital administrators, it's time they introduce whole and fresh foods, preferably plant-based foods, that heal and not harm our patients. And that must be, that must be an immediate goal. Secondly, we need to ban processed meats, classified as class one carcinogens, stuff that will cause cancers by the WHO. We also have to ban sugary beverages. We're still sell selling sodas and vending machines. When's the last time you saw a vending machine? Go to a hospital, you'll find one. <laughs> we gotta ban fast food restaurants in our hospitals. Just yesterday, someone from Maine General Hospital emailed me telling me that they actually have banned these from that hospital. You don't have to go too far. Dr. Osfeld, is Rob here? Rob will be here. 
Let's follow what he's doing up in Montefiore, bringing plant-based diets into the cardiac unit. So I just want to say a couple last ending quotes here. Um, we talk about change and working within the system to achieve that. Right? That's what I've done for 12 years. Last time I was on this stage, I actually gave my notice the day before that I'm leaving Lenox Hill Hospital in North Shore to start my own thing. The problem with always conforming is that when you try to change the system from within, it's not you who changes the system. It's a system that will eventually try to change you. <laughs> Students, you hear that? There is nothing wrong with compromising the situation, but compromising yourself in a situation is a completely different story and completely wrong. We need to explore new ways and new approaches to integrate programs so that together they can support better health outcomes. So I just want to, in closing here, I just want to say that I've dedicated my life to changing how we do medicine. We need a fresh start and approach to health. That's why we started Fresh Medicine. It's an integrative medicine practice in Brooklyn, right across the courts from you, Mr. Adams. <laughs> right across, just a walk away. <laughs> and a train ride for you guys here where we, in fact, do keep it real. We offer real medicine. And we have a first, first, first approach. And this is our motto. When it comes to our health, it starts with food. But in the end of the day, we all, what we truly all want to be is happy. And I just want to end here with a couple of things. So as a goal of mine, trying to combine all of these worlds together, I have given up this coat for this coat. And later on today, I've actually just entered culinary school this past fall at the Natural Gourmet Institute. Later, I'll be hosting a cooking demo. And this is my class. I was just there last night. These are, I think, the true healers that are going to be coming up in the next couple of years. So I believe that we all have the power to change this. But this is just the beginning. We need to have an honest, and I hope this is going to happen today, informed debate about how, how each of us can play a role more effectively going forward. Our nation's health, well-being, and economy depend on it. Remember, if your life's work can be accomplished in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. And to end, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Thank you so much.